Hey, thanks, Paul. Paul, and thanks for having me join you in this lecture. Um, I've been looking through the syllabus, and, and there's already quite a number of really excellent lectures by Paul and uh, Dick Hay and Walter Smith. And um, one of the benefits of, of being involved in this is I can now steal all those great PowerPoints and PDF slides for my own class. They're really wonderful. You'll have some more lectures by Dietmar and other people. So it's really a great opportunity to gather all this stuff together. Um, Paul and Walter really talked a lot about the technical aspects of satellite altimetry and how you would use satellite altimetry to make bathymetry and so on. Um, so I thought I wouldn't really discuss that much today, and I would just discuss more about uh, plate tectonics and how satellite altimetry contributes to plate tectonics. And then, um, and I've broken this up into two, two groups, uh, which I call the knowns and the unknowns. And um, what I mean by knowns is that uh, these are the parts of plate tectonics that people all agree on. Um, we have ridges uh, where the plates spread apart. We have transform faults where you have transform motion. And we have subduction zones where things get destroyed. Um, and then there are also things like microplates and propagating rifts and other perturbations to this model. Dick Hay probably talked about those things. Um, but I call them knowns mainly because uh, people understand them and they're required by plate tectonic theory, at least the first three things. Um, the unknowns are the things that happened later on, um, and they may, they're not even related to plate tectonics. They're not required by plate tectonics. And um, I'll talk today about two of those unknowns. One is um, hot spots, and hot spots meaning uh, linear volcanic chains where you have active volcanoes at one end, um, and whether or not they're caused by mantle plumes. I saw in one of the lectures Paul did, he talked about um, mantleplumes.org. And um, it, there are a number of uh, scientists who, who no longer believe that mantle plumes are, um, are creation, creating hot spots. Um, linear volcanic chains or hot spots might be created some, by some other processes. So I'll, I'll address one question. How many hot spots are caused by mantle plumes? And at one end of the spectrum, we have Julian Folger and Don Anderson, who's hate zero. And the other end of the spectrum, I don't know, but maybe 49 or so uh, hot spot mantle plume connections. And then the second thing that I think is really an unknown is are these Haxby gravity lineations um, that were discovered by Bill Haxby back in the early 80s. And, um, and really, they still aren't well understood. And I'll, I'll spend the last part of the lecture talking about um, these gravity lineations and, and the possible models and, and how you might uh, design an experiment to go and try to understand these things. So hopefully, you'll understand the first part of the lecture. And I hope you're sort of confused by the second part, because I don't think there's clear answers to any of this stuff in the, in the second part. Um, next slide. Oops, one's not advancing. Ah. Here we go. Um, this is a slide. Actually, I can see your screen there. This is a slide of a model of plate tectonics. This is a typical slide that you find in a textbook. And it shows these three elements, these spreading ridges, um, the red uh, zones in the middle of this mid-ocean, the, the transform faults, which are a little green line connecting the two ridge axes. And um, it also this model also has abyssal hills, which are really an important part of the spreading process. And then finally, you have the subduction zones. That's where the plates are destroyed. So we have this nice, nice clean, simple, neat model of um, plate tectonics. And first of all, a lot of geologists draw these kind of things. And you really shouldn't believe them, because they're just a sketch of what they believe is going on. But in this case, I think um, we have really good evidence that, that the seafloor spreading plate tectonics looks a lot like this simple model. OK, here's the next slide. Um, this is from an EOS article that was um, published in, in the late 70s by uh, Holden and Vogt. And it had a lot of really interesting cartoons in it. And I like this one here. This is a cartoon that explains mantle plumes. And you see um, how convoluted or how simple 
these things are. They have the, the plume juice bag and you fill it up with something and then it squirts out the top and it burns a hole in the plate. Um, I don't quite understand why the the magnets are there. Maybe this is at a ridge axis, so you're you're reversing the magnetic field and uh, and and creating magnetic anomalies. But this is sort of a convoluted model of, of plumes. And actually, back then, the whole paper was on how they didn't really understand plumes. And that was in 1977. I think even today, we're not a lot further along in understanding these things. And there's a lot of debate, which is good uh, for the scientific community. Next slide. OK, so satellite altimetry. I think you've seen this slide before, but I'll go through it very briefly. Um, this is a technique for mapping the gravity field over the oceans. And actually, what it's measuring is the height of the ocean surface relative to a reference ellipsoidal surface. And um, you do that by using a radar that measures this H uh, in the diagram. It sends out 1,000 or so pulses a second. These range off the bumpy ocean waves. The swells are a problem. Um, but they can be overcome because the footprint of the radar is, is, is quite large, uh, a few kilometers. And then if you uh, track the satellite with respect to this reference ellipsoid, you can difference the two and get the sea surface height. And um, that has two components. It has the geoid, which I think Walter Smith talked about the geoid last time. Um, and that's actually the largest component, p plus or minus. 100 meters, uh, although the features we'll look at, it's plus or minus a meter or less. Uh, the accuracy of this measurement is, is maybe um, two or three centimeters. And the second component of the sea surface is the ocean currents and the dynamics and the tides and so on. That's the part we're not interested in, but most oceanographers are, do care about. So what we're going to be looking at in the next few slides are just a gravity field that was created by uh, taking this geoid model and running it through Laplace's equation and getting the gravity. The gra gravity is the vertical derivative of, of the gravitational potential. This is the gravity anomaly. And the gravitational potential is equal to the geoid scaled by 9.82, the small g constant. Um, next slide. Now, if you um, make a map of the ocean surface and we're able to illuminate it from a very low sun angle, this is what you would get. This is the map of the ocean surface derived from satellite altimetry. So um, it, you know, it's really interesting. It's got all these bumps and dips and fractures and, and things. And of course, you can see Hawaii right there in the middle with the Hawaiian Emperor Sinau chain. Um, and the, the fracture zones that are, go across the Pacific and record the, the plate motions, the plate tectonics. So this is rather interesting measurement. This is the north component of the slope of the geoid, so it's the derivative. But what I'll talk about next are the gravity anomalies, which are just a combination of, linear combination of these slopes. Okay, so what, what, what have we learned from satellite altimetry? And I'll start with um, what I'm going to call the knowns. And um, this is most of this altimetry work started after CSAT. CSAT was launched in 1978. Um, so, uh, and most of the plate tectonic activity was done in the 60s and 70s. So plate tectonics is basically understood and over by the time uh, CSAT was launched. So a lot of the the work done by CSAT and the other altimeters is really just a confirmation of plate tectonics, um, but also some, some new discoveries, mainly related to global access to the ocean basins. We didn't have such good global coverage. So the first topic is um, uh, confirming and re refining plate tectonics. And here I'll just show a bunch of pretty pictures to illustrate uh, why I believe that simple textbook model is really real. You know, it, it's really the way it is. It's, it's surprising to me. Um, next slide. OK, so this is the gravity field. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. This is the gravity field in the South Atlantic Ocean derived from a whole bunch of altimeter data. And 
Um, now, I don't have a pointer, but I think you can see what's going on here. We have the, the mid-ocean ridge going down the center of the image from top to bottom. And what always is amazing to me is, is the ridges and transform faults. So if you start at the top, you can see the ridge, and then there's a transform fault, a short ridge segment, another transform fault, another ridge, and so on. Just ridge, transform, ridge, transform, ridge, transform. It's monotonous. It's boring. But it's, it's exactly what the textbook showed, almost, um, which is really quite surprising, because most geology is not really this simple. Um, the other thing you can see on this slide, um, if you look carefully, is you can start to see these abyssal hills uh, showing up. These are hills that are parallel to the ridges, but are between the two fracture zones. Um, and, and these are slightly visible. I think Walter talked about these. Oh, yeah. Walter talked about these things. Um, and we'd like to get a new altimeter. I don't know if he talked about this. A new altimeter to, to try to resolve these better. These are of interest to physical oceanographers looking at things like deep ocean mixing and, and other things in the open ocean. Um, you can even see um, a propagating rift uh, trail in this image. If you, if you look at the, the marker that says 500 kilometers and you follow that segment across towards the east, um, you'll see um, a little diagonal line. And there's another matching one on the other side. And these, this is an old propagating rift like what Dick Hay probably talked about. So this is really a nice example of bridges and transforms. Um, Next slide. Oh, I'd advance mine. OK. Um, this is uh, just an overview of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge um, between uh, South America and Africa. And in this case, you can see the fracture zones, which are the inactive parts of the transform fault. So the transform faults are active today. They have earthquakes. Um, the fracture zones are the inactive traces left behind. And you can trace these features across the ocean basins and use that to um, reconstruct the plates. And I'll talk very briefly about this later. I think Dietmar Mueller will talk about it uh, next uh, lecture. But um, this has really been an important data set for reconstructing, doing detailed plate reconstructions, looking at these fractures on traces. Next slide. OK, here's, here's an example of the gravity field um, in the North Pacific Ocean, this arcuate structure near the top is the Aleutian Arc. Uh, Alaska is in the upper right. That's where Sarah, Sarah Palin is up there. I don't think she's there today. Um, she's getting ready for a debate. Uh, but um, yeah, you can see Moscow. Now, you can't see Moscow, but I think you can see Russia from uh, um, Fair She's not in Fairbanks. She's in Anchorage. That's right. Anyways. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, you can see these beautiful negative gravity anomalies along the subduction zones. These are where the plates are diving back into the Earth, and there's a huge trench there creating a, a mass deficit and a gravity negative. Um, and, and these are marvelous things. The, the seismicity, of course, if you could look at where, this, where the earthquakes are, they would tell you where the slab is going down into the mantle in a much more precise way. So you need the seismicity to also tell you about subduction zones. But this is really quite an interesting confirmation of that. You can also see the emperor chain uh, going down in this notch between the two subduction zones. So it's getting ready to subduct there. Uh, next slide. Um, here's one of my favorite areas of the ocean. This is the Indian Ocean Triple Junction. So where are we here? Um, if you went directly north, you would hit India. If you went to the, uh, the west, you see Madagascar is sort of the blurry um, blob over there, the brown blob on the left. And then on the right is the 90s ridge. Australia would be off the map over on the right. Um, and this is the uh, connection between three spreading centers that's predicted by plate tectonics. It's a beautiful example. Um, we have the central Indian ridge coming down from the north. It's this series of ridges and transforms, very boring. And it reaches a, a point here um, called the triple junction in the center of the slide. And then off to the, 
to the bottom right of the slide is the southeast Indian Ridge, another ridge axis coming up to this point. And then on the lower left of the slide is the southwest Indian Ridge coming up to this point. And um, it's just a beautiful example. And if you took the directions of the, of the fracture zones along between those three plates, we have plate A, B, and C, um, and you look, looked at the direction vectors, you could sum those direction vectors and they'd sum back to zero. And um, just, just like in plate tectonic theory, it's really nice. Uh, this is a nice example. There are lots of other triple junctions, not lots, but I think there's six or so that you can find in the ocean basins. They don't have, all have to be ridges. They can be ridges, transforms, and any combination of ridges and transforms and subduction zones. OK, um, here's a, a beautiful example of a back arc spreading. And in fact, I think um, you've already seen some bathymetry from this area that was collected by uh, a lot of scientists, in, including Brian Taylor there at, at uh, Hawaii. And they've done a beautiful uh, bathymetry and study of the back arc spreading in this, in this um, part of the world. And basically, this is an area where the uh, Pacific plate is literally falling vertically into the, into the mantle. And as it falls, it creates this void. And you've got to ha fill the void with something. So you have this spreading going on behind uh, the island arc there. Um, and you know, it's another nice example. This is not mainstream. I and mean, this is a smaller part of plate tectonics, but it's important. Next slide. OK, so you know, that's the part. You can look around and find all these nice examples that match this simple diagram here that you find in the textbooks. But um, it's not always like this. And there have been some perturbations. And uh, first, I'll talk about the ones that we, that we sort of understand. And then I'll talk about um, some of the things that are, are new and not understood. So microplates and propagating ridges, I think Dick Hay talked a lot about this. And um, I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'll show you some examples. Uh, uh, this is sort of a blurry, uh, ugly gravity map of, of the Pacific, the Central Pacific Ocean. And I'll try to explain it to you. Um, where are we? It's uh, a good question. South America is off to the right. And we're in, in the Southern Pacific Ocean out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and you can see coming in from the very top here is, is, a, very, is a tiny little axial high. That's the uh, East Pacific rise axis yeah, right up there. And it's coming down to, to meet up with the um, eastern microplate, which is this sort of distorted region in the center there. And then um, there'll be another connection between that microplate and the Juan Fernandez microplate down below. And then finally, uh, you'll have a triple junction where you have the, uh, the Chile fracture zone coming into this whole thing. And so you've got two ridges and a fracture zone. And from then on, it's called the Pacific Antarctic Rise, because it's the, the ridge axis down there separates the Pacific and the Antarctic plates rather than the Pacific and the Nazca plate. So this is a little bit messy, but it's still pretty well understood by, by plate tectonic theory. Uh, the next slide. OK, here's um, another thing that's a little messy, but I think um, Dick probably explained this to you quite well. These are called propagating risks. And where am I looking here? There's a, a zone um, just south of Australia in the center of the slide. And there's three little features that look like ridges, ridge highs. And um, they have like a motorboat wake coming off um, the top and off the bottom. And, and the upper part of that is the, the pseudo fault. And I think Dick probably talked about this. These, are, these ridges are sort of propagating along and creating a pseudo fault and a shear zone. And uh, this, is, this is a really nice example. And there are lots of these in the oceans. OK, um, what else is sort of well known from altimetry? And not just from altimetry, but this is actually discovered from uh, seafloor mapping early on is that there are basically two flavors. Oh, that's, yeah, well, advance it, please. Yeah. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, there are basically two flavors of um, spreading ridges. There are the, the fast spreading ridges, which you have mainly in the Pacific Basin. And these have, um, here it's labeled the East Pacific Rise over there. At zero, they have a small axial high. Um, and the abyssal hills surrounding the ridge axis are, are of low amplitude, maybe a few hundred meters tall. If we go to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the spreading rate is lower, say, total rate of 23 millimeters a year, um, you get a large axial valley um, and large adjacent uh, abyssal hills, very large, very different. The seafloor is, is very, very different. And this is something that was understood by Bill Menard and, and, and people early on, but um, really all the altimetry showed the global nature of this, uh, these, these changes in morphology with spreading rate. And that's here on the right-hand slide. There's, these are plots of, um, the upper one is a plot of the release. So this would be the, the height of the ridge axis. So if it's positive, you have an axial high. If it's negative, you have an axial valley. And on the horizontal axis is the spreading rate going from zero to a maximum rate of about 160 millimeters a year. And um, you see an interesting behavior here. At all the fast spreading ridges above 80, millimeters a year, you get these axial highs. And um, if you go to lower rates, you switch over to the axial valleys, and, and, and there's, a trend, there's sort of a slope in that line there. So they get more intense as you go to slower spreading rates. And there's this pretty sharp transition, right about 80 millimeters a year, that's interesting. I think Walter talked quite a bit about this. Uh, the next slide. Okay, this is just an illustration of the gravity field in these two spreading environments. So you've got on the left the gravity field of the fast spreading East Pacific rise, and on the right the gravity field of the slow spreading uh, southern mid Atlantic ridge. And you can see these are on the same horizontal scale with the same color scale and everything. You can see they're very, very different. So um, it's an important part of plate tectonics. I don't think this is even well understood today. Why? why there are these differences. There's lots of theories, but um, no one can really agree on, on a particular theory. Uh, of course, it has something to do with spreading rate. Next slide. Um, global seafloor age. Now, I'm, all, I'm not going to say anything about this hardly, because I think Dietmar will talk a lot about this uh, in, a, in a couple weeks, but um, only to say uh, a couple things. Right, the next slide. Yeah, you really need if you're going to make a global seafloor age map, you need you need two things. Um, you need to know what direction the plates are going, and you need to know the age of the plate at a particular point. Um, and from altimetry and from gravity, and for also from seafloor mapping. You can pretty much map out the, uh, the distribution of the fracture zones, which tell you about where the direction of the, the past seafloor spreading. So you can reconstruct all the plates. Um, but from this particular case, you could say, yeah, Africa was next to uh, South America over there. But you have no idea how long ago that was. No idea. So what you need, in addition to that, are marine magnetic anomalies. Um, and other means to give you the age of the ocean floor uh, at a few spots. And from the age with this data, you can make really nice uh, reconstructions of the plates. Uh, um, next slide. So I think Dietmar will talk about how he and others have put, put together this global age map, which is really a wonderful thing when you're doing modeling of the ocean basins and also for understanding what happened in the past because you can then uh, look at uh, like what the subduction zones did you know 100 million years ago and try to figure out where the slabs are in the mantle and all kinds of cool stuff like that so um, I think Dietmar will talk talk some about that next slide okay um, one other contribution from altimetry is to uh, map out 
the seamount distribution in the oceans. And Paul, I think, talked about this. He's done most of the work in this area um, with students there. And um, basically, what they find, can I have the next slide? I'm not going to show any examples because he's probably already shown some. Basically, what they find is you can find, you can discover all the seamounts that are greater than two kilometers high. Um, you know, these are big features, greater than two kilometers high, and, and there's a few thousand of them. How many are there, Paul? About 6,000? Something like that. Maybe about 6,000. So um, I can't hear what you're saying. So, Anyways, um, what you can learn from this kind of exercise is that if you project the number of seamounts back to, uh, say, one kilometer high, you would find um, that there are, uh, geez, how many is that? 30,000, Paul? OK. Um, so uh, this is really a, a great thing, because you can then try to use the seamounts to understand um, hotspot chains and also things like biology in the oceans. So if the seamounts come up to a shallow depth, uh, they can have a lot of biological activity and so on. The next slide is. This is one that Paul didn't find. And we're going to blame this on him. Um, I can't hear what he's saying, so uh, I'll blame it on Paul. Actually, I, I, think, I think that the Navy didn't use these gravity maps when they were navigating this nuclear submarine. Um, this happened in January 2005. This, this submarine was running from um, Guam to Australia. And the amazing things it was going 33 knots and 100 meters, 160 meters depth, and it crashed into this seamount, uh, completely uncharted seamount. Uh, and they took a sounding of 2,000 meters four minutes before the crash. So uh, they didn't have any warning. Uh, bang, they ran right into this thing. So that was pretty interesting. And it, it's sort of a wake-up call to people charting the oceans that um, you know, we really don't know much about what's out there uh, in detail. We have these global maps, but they really aren't that good everywhere in detail. And it would be good to try to map the oceans better. Uh, next slide. OK, so finally, um, I'll get on with the, the more uncertain part and the more interesting part of the lecture and confusing part. And that's related to. Uh, two items. The first one I'll talk about is just hot spots and plumes. I don't know how much you've discussed this. Um, and the second part is about these Haxby gravity lineations, which have always fascinated me because we don't understand them, but yet they're they're obvious features in in the oceans. Next slide. Uh, yeah, you have this it says gravity. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so here's the topic, gravity lineations and linear volcanic ridges. So they originate in the asthenosphere, which is, is the sort of fluid-like layer below the lithosphere, or are they just simply lithospheric things, cracks in the plate where the magma escapes. And first I'll talk about, in general, linear volcanic chains and how do they form. And there are sort of three hypotheses that are being floated around now. The original one is the mantle plumes. Of course, these are things that are coming up from deep in the mantle and impinging on the base of the lithosphere and, um, and, and burning a hole through and creating something like Hawaii, which I believe is related to a mantle plume, but some people don't. Um, or they could be simply cracks in the plate in the lithosphere where the magma escapes. Or you could have some kind of small scale convection in the asthenosphere that creates these linear volcanic chains. And, and the second item is how do they we form these cross-grain gravity lineaments? And I'll show you an example of what they are um, next, because they're, they're really quite odd structures, completely unrelated to plate tectonics. Um, so uh, are they due to small-scale convection or thermal bending or something in the lithosphere? Um, next slide. 
Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I was going to tell you about these Haxby gravity lineations and why they're so unusual and mysterious and why we should go study them. Um, and this was really a discovery made by Bill Haxby back in 1983 using CSAT altimetry data. And back then, the altimetry data wasn't as good as it is today. But it was just good enough to see these things. And they made these maps. And when I first saw this map, I thought, this is nonsense. It's some kind of a gridding error. Um, I don't believe any of this stuff. And then we plotted the data. And lo and behold, these things are real. Uh, so yeah, what we're looking at here are, um, this is the, the Central Pacific Ocean. You can see the East Pacific rise, the black line coming down on the right-hand side. Um, and you can see the fracture zones of, of the old, the old fracture zones going in sort of a diagonal direction. Um, and, and these gravity lineations are the, the grain that's going in the direction of that big arrow. There are these uh, sort of plus or minus 10 milligal variations in gravity that go in this direction of the big arrow. And you can see Hawaii up in the upper left there. So the arrow is going in the direction of the Hawaiian chain. And this is the absolute plate motion direction, pretty much. But what's interesting is it's not the direction of the relative plate motion. So these are things that have overprinted the plate tectonic fabric. These are cross-grain, so-called gravity lineations. Um, and what I want you to focus on, maybe, maybe it's later on in the talk, but we'll talk about um, how they develop on, on the seafloor. They don't up here, you can't see them when you go up and down the ridge axis. So in other words, they aren't ridge axis features. They're formed off the ridge axis. So that further confirms they aren't part of the normal plate tectonic process. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I'll come back to these in a minute. But this is, this is my, uh, these are the unknowns. We're going to go through the unknowns. Um, now, linear volcanic chains, I'll, I'll tell you later, are associated with these uh, gravity lineations. So there's some connection between the two. But um, the linear volcanic chains are also uh, associated with mantle plumes. So I'm going to mix these two ideas and confuse you a little bit. But um, there's this whole idea of linear volcanic chains and, and what are the possible processes that could create these things. We've got the mantle plumes idea. Here's another idea that was what was proposed early on, actually. Um, these are just cracks in the plates formed by uh, the slab pull of the subduction zones around the Pacific and Nazca plates and other plates. Or they could be small-scale convection. The next slide. OK, so in your reading list, I'm sure you've all read all those papers in the reading list, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's only a few. Uh, anyways, one of the papers is by Cordio and, and, and L. And I like this paper because they've taken a very objective approach to mantle plumes. They just said, you know, there's a lot of debate on whether something, whether a hotspot's related to a mantle plume. So they said, let's go through and make a table. Uh, take all the, all the hotspot chains, make a table, and, and assign these attributes. Do they have a linear volcanic chain? with some kind of an age progression? Is there a flood basalt at the origin of the track? Um, do they have a large buoyancy flux? What does that mean? That means that um, there's a big swell on the seafloor surrounding these volcanic chains. And that's what you find, for example, in Hawaii. And you can measure the, uh, the size of that swell. And it's called the buoyancy flux. Um, do they have consistently high helium-3 to 4 ratios? Um, and that's also another indication of, of a deep mantle source for the magma. Um, are there shear wave velocities low on the underlying mantle? And one thing I didn't like about this paper is they left out the geoid topography part, which I'm interested in. And most people don't care or know about it. But uh, there's really strong evidence from the geoid that you can say whether something is supported deep in, in the mantle, like you know, 60 kilometers or 80 kilometers deep, or is it just supported by thickened crust? And I'll go through this 
next. Um, next slide. Okay, so here's their table um, that they put together, a list of 49 potential, uh, well, 49 hotspots with their attributes. And um, it, it's really a nice compilation. And I went through and I said, how many of these things have more than three of those attributes? And the list is over there. There's about nine of them. Um, they don't always have the same three, but they have three attributes. So we can start saying these are candidate mantle plumes. Um, Hawaii's in there. We've got uh, Iceland, Louisville Ridge, Reunion, Samoa, Tristan de Kuna, Easter Island, Caroline, Afar. Next slide. OK, so as I said, one of the things they forgot to talk about was the geoid topography um, ratio. And here's another paper, uh, a couple papers that, was, that were on your reading list. I'm sure you've all read this. And <laughs> actually, if you're interested in geophysics, you, you should really sit down someday and, and derive this equation one here. Um, it, this is in a book by Ge called Geodynamics by Turcotte and Schubert. Um, but it, it, what it's saying to you, and, and I'll say it to you in words, is that the geoid height at any particular location above a feature only depends on the integral of the density directly beneath that feature. Um, you don't have to worry about things off to the side. And this is not what you learned in normal uh, potential theory. You, you learned that you have to integrate over the whole half space or the whole layer. But this says you can just consider what's directly beneath you. And it's a bit of magic. And the way the magic works is um, you have to make a couple of assumptions. One is that things are isostatically compensated. So in other words, when the topography comes up at a certain level, um, there has to be a root that goes down. And, um, and that root uh, supports the topography and is equal and opposite mass. And the second assumption is that this is um, a long wavelength phenomena. Uh, so you can make some long wavelength approximations. OK, so you go through all this math. And the bottom line is that you have sort of two models for how features in the ocean basins could be supported. And one is the oceanic plateau or continental plateau model. I sort of grouped those together. And there you have the topography being supported by a root. And there's a nice equation in Turcotte and Schubert that says this is the ratio of geoid height to topography for that, that system. And then the, the bottom one is for a thermal swell. And this is more like a hot spot or where a plume is impinging on the base of the plate, thinning the lithosphere and creating um, low density material uh, at the lithosphere, asthenosphere boundary there. And, um, and in that case, the geoid topography ratio is higher. So we can actually look at these data around the planet and say, oh, that one's that one's a thickened crust. That one looks like a thermal swell, and so on. You can actually say this. And the next slide. So here are some examples. The top three are the geoid uh, height versus topography on some area compensated plateaus. And these have a slope that's appropriate for uh, thickened crust. And then the bottom one has a much higher slope, Bermuda, Cape Verde, Hawaii. Um, and this is more appropriate for a thermal swell. And in fact, this is one of the main reasons I believe that there has to be some kind of mantle plumes at some of these places. Because you can't create this high geoid topography ratio with, by cracking the lithosphere and doing all those other crazy things. So um, I'm definitely not a zero person in the zero to 49 uh, number of plumes. Next, next slide. If, if you put this all together, you find um, there's a group uh, in the black here in the lower part that could be, um, they're, they're supported by shallow compensation. So it doesn't mean they weren't once uh, plumes, but related to plumes, but they aren't today. They don't have any thermal signature left. Whereas if you go to the upper part, the red area, 
you've got all these features like Hawaii and Cape Verde and Bermuda and the Line Islands and Marquesas and, and so on. These are all supported deeper in the in the lithosphere than can be just a crustal thickness. And so these have to be related to some kind of something going on in the mantle, something hot. Next slide. So the bottom line is I think there are three, at least three, um, that have all the characteristics of mantle plume. So if, if I were going to go between 0 and 49, I would go, actually I think there's about six or eight that have really good evidence that there are plumes uh, in, in the mantle. And so let me move on. I can see I've already been 45 minutes. I better go a little quicker here. But um, So the next point is that there's a whole bunch of things linear volcanic chains that aren't mantle plumes. So although I believe they're not related to mantle plumes, although I believe in plumes, there's all this other stuff that um, is probably created by other processes. And in fact, if you look closely, they look to be associated with, um, oh, the next, next slide, please. Yeah. OK, so there's all this other stuff in the Central Pacific gravity field that um, appears to be associated with uh, these hack speed gravity lineations, which is sort of odd. Um, and this is where it gets confusing. Uh, and so let me point to a few of these things. The next slide. Um, we're zooming in a little bit. Um, and now we can see, uh, you can see these specific rise, that little tiny thing that's running sort of north-south. And, and then you see these little volcanic ridges off to the, uh, the west of the East Pacific Rise. And in fact, these are not little volcanic ridges. They're gigantic features. They just appear small on this map. But um, let's zoom in some more. Next slide. Oh, before I do that, here's some things that I don't understand at all. Maybe, maybe someone wants to help me uh, explain help me understand these things. But these are north-south running structures. Between those arrows, there's these sort of north-south running lineations. They aren't artifacts. They're real things in the gravity. They could be decays propagating rifts, but it looks to me that one of them crosses an old fracture zone, which is impossible for a propagator. So um, who knows? What are these things? I have no idea. Uh, next slide. OK, so um, I don't think these things are related to uh, mantle plumes. So there's other uh, models that have been proposed. And one of them is that you have uh, plate boundary forces that are pulling on the plates and stretching them and creating cracks. And there's, there's a whole group of people that are now leaning towards this idea for these smaller scale features. Next slide. Um, yeah, I better get moving on this. Uh, this is a plot, an, an old paper by Forsyth and Ueda. I don't know if it's on your reading list, but you should read it. Anyways, um, and it explains the the forces uh, driving the plates. And there's basically swell push force or gravitational sliding force. And that's where the plates slide off the ridge axis. Um, then there's the drag force, which is basically a force at the base of the plate as the plates slide over this viscous sustenus here, and then there's the trench pull. And it turns out the trench pull force is probably three times bigger than the other one. So this is the main driving force for plate tectonics. Next slide. Um, so there have been proposals that um, uh, features of plate tectonics are created by these rifts in the plate due to the slab pull on the perimeters of the plate. And here's, here's a model put together back in 1981. Next slide. Here, here's the uh, manifestation of that on the seafloor today. Um, you had the, the Nazca plate, plate, which is below, and the, and the Cocos plate above. And these were all one plate originally. And they got drifted along the Galapagos spreading center there. Um, and according to that model, it was the slab pole that cause the rifting. Next slide. Um, let me skip this one. Next slide. 
Okay, so here's a, a paper by Jim Natland and Jerry Winter, and and these are the main some of the main proponents of this idea that um, that a lot of the volcanic features we see in the ocean basins are not related to mantle plumes, but are are related to plate reorganizations and stresses from the plant boundaries and so on. So this is a mainstream idea, and it has uh, good evidence for. Uh, explaining a lot of these things. Next slide. Okay, so now um, I'll confuse you some more, and we'll go on to these uh, Haxby gravity lineations um, and, and show you what they are, and then go through some of the models that have been proposed. I think these are very poorly understood structures, um, but, but I think I explained this before. They're, let me go to the next slide. Here, here we go. So we're back to this slide showing these gravity lineations. And as I explained before, they're, they cross the grain of the normal seafloor spreading fabric. Um, they seem to be aligned in the direction of absolute plate motion, as defined by the hotspots, the Hawaiian chain mainly. But you also see them on the Nazca plate. So if you, if you look at that, there's a little A. A down there, A, B, C, D, see those profiles? If you look at A and you look off to just the right of that onto the Nazca plate, you can see a few of these gravity lineations, which suggests maybe they just aren't on the Pacific plate. Maybe they aren't necessarily related to absolute plate motion. Um, the other thing that's really important, and you'll see this in the next slide, is that they seem to grow. So if we look at these gravity lineations along profile A, they aren't apparent at all. In profile B, they get a little stronger. C, they're a little stronger, all the way up to, to E and so on. And that's about where they max out, right about profile E, 10 million years or so. Next slide. And here are, some profi here are those profiles. So this is the gravity uh, as a function of distance. Uh, along those different profiles, and the age is marked on the right-hand side. Um, and you see them growing in amplitude with, um, with age. And if you go along the spreading ridge, you won't see any evidence for these things. Um, and the wavelength is typically 150 kilometers. So um, the question is, is that a property of, of the lithosphere? Is that a lithosphere wavelength, or is that something deeper in the, in the Earth creating these things? Next slide. Oops. Mine didn't go. Oops. Go back one, please. There we go. OK, so um, superimposed on these gravity lineations are volcanic ridges. And, um, and when you do the analysis, you'll find that these volcanic ri ridges primarily occur in the troughs of the gravity lineations. They aren't in the crest, they're in the trough, which is very odd. You'd expect them to be on the top, maybe where it's hotter. But in fact, they seem to be in the troughs. And I'll zoom in on uh, some example of these ridges in the next slide. Uh, yeah, go to the next slide. And you see these are quite large structures. They're, these examples are 100 kilometers long and two, two or three or four kilometers tall. So they're giant volcanic features. They aren't tiny like you'd expect from that last slide. And they're basically pervasive on the seafloor. We don't have much of the seafloor map, but that area of the world, these things are probably everywhere, including those little volcanoes off on the east side there. Next slide. OK, well, now, now is the last part of the talk and the confusion. And I know I'm going to have to let you go in a few minutes. Um, but. Here, here are the models that have been proposed to explain the gravity lineations and, and the volcanic ridges. And I'll start with model A in the upper left, the original model by Haxby and Weissel. You have small scale convective rolls that are aligned in the direction of absolute plate motion by the shear of the Pacific plate uh, moving over the asthenosphere. And this is a model that was developed by Frank Richter. They're called Richter rolls. And so they're well known in the fluid mechanics literature. And this is a possible explanation for these gravity lineations. But I think 
This model predicts the ridges on the crest of the lineations. Uh, we proposed a model that these might be the plate stretching. So you've got the entire Pacific plate maybe getting stretched by the uh, surrounding subduction zone, the pull of the surrounding subduction zones, creating boudinage type structures and cracking the plate and creating volcanoes. I'll show you next that's not possible, but uh, it's, we proposed it. It's probably wrong. The, the Model C is this thermal contraction model proposed first by GANS and people at um, UCSB. And this is a, a, a variant on what uh, Paul Wessel did for his thesis, looking at the, um, uh, the development of thermal elastic stress in a cooling sheet. And I think he explained this in one of the lectures. You, get, you end up having compression on the top, tension on the bottom, and and if some way you could magically come along and put cracks in that plate, you could create these hummocky structures with volcanoes on the, in the troughs. And, and that's an interesting idea. And then there's this Model D that's proposed by the Brown Group. And this is, um, the plate doesn't do anything. You've got this, these fingers of asthenospheric channels flowing from the hotspots in the Western Pacific back towards the ridge axis. And um, these fingers are hot, and so they create gravity lows because they're hot. And then they have volcanoes above them because they're hot. So this is the array of models that's been proposed um, for these things. Well, this one, I don't believe it anymore because you can show from plate tectonics that there's not enough stretching in the plate to, uh, to create these structures. Oops, I'm sorry. Go to the next slide, yeah. Oh, yeah, you did. OK, yeah, you went to that slide. Um, next slide, please. OK. Now, th this is a key observation that these gravity lineations are, the ridges are in the troughs of the gravity lineations. And you can look at this statistically, but if you just look at a map here, it shows the little black dots. These are the volcanic ridges. And they do appear to be in these troughs of the gravity lineations, which I think rules out the small-scale convection idea. Uh, next slide. OK, so we've got two models gone, and we're down to two at the bottom here. Um, although a lot of people wouldn't yet rule out the small-scale convection model. Next slide. Let me skip that one. Next slide. Skip that one. OK. Um, now we're down to the thermal contraction model. Um, and uh, again, this is th the nice thing about this model is that you can go from first principles and explain both the amplitude and wavelength of the gravity lineations. And this works out quite well. You get the right size gravity anomalies, and you get the right uh, spacing of the cracks if you go through a, 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 an energy minimization calculation. Uh, next slide. Uh, OK, so I think I just said that, that you can predict both the amplitude and the wavelengths. Next slide. Um, so how do you do this? Uh, you, you go through this thermoelastic bending moment calculation that was first done by Parmentier and Haxby, and then uh, by Paul Wessel and, and Haxby, um, and, and calculate the amount of thermal bending moment that develops in this cooling sheet. And this is, it's fun to go through this exercises and do this calculation. And then you can say, um, introduce cracks in the plate and find the crack spacing that uh, maximizes the energy release, the thermal elastic energy release. And if you make the cracks too narrowly spaced, you, you don't release as much energy as if you have them at the right spacing. I um, won't go through this, but there's a little bit of math involved. Um, the next slide. This is just that math. and But the top panel shows um, the amplitude of the topography that you get. And it's only about 200 meters. It's pretty low relief uh, over about a wavelength of about 150 kilometers. And the gravities 
uh, only about uh, six or eight milligals. So this is about the right numbers for um, what we see in the Pacific clay. Next slide. Um, now what would you do if you wanted to really understand these features? You'd have to go out to see. Satellite altimetry doesn't work. And so um, there's a variety of things that you could do. You could map the seafloor in a large enough area to try to map out those uh, bends in the plate, the flexures. And um, the other thing you could do is deploy uh, ocean bottom seismometers and look at look at the mantle, the, see if you can see a signal in the asthenosphere from uh, the elastic waves traveling through the, the mantle and see if you can see the the convective signature or some other asthenospheric signature. Um, we also proposed an MT experiment uh, to try to map the, the mantle signature. And if, if you want to learn something about oceanography, um, one of the things that we all do is write proposals. This is the fourth time to try to do this. And it's pretty common to have to write your proposal many times before it gets funded. Uh, Eventually, the good ones will get funded, so uh, you have to keep trying. Next slide. Um, just the kind of arguments you'd make for this kind of proposal. If you're trying to distinguish between these four models um, that I, I put up there first, you would um, say, well, what are the predictions of the model? And then test whether or not the, uh, the predictions map match the observations. And I've already sort of ruled out the the extension model and the small. This is just a table showing the the various model predictions, and I think we're down to two models now: the uh, thermal contraction model and the stenospheric channel model. And we'd like to go out to sea and and test these models with a seagoing experiment. Um, but this is typical of of what people do in in ocean science research: uh, write proposals and and try to test hypotheses. The next slide. I think this is the, I think this is the end here. So in conclusion, um, I tried to go through the knowns and the unknowns. And the knowns, I hope, were, were sort of a review of what you've already seen um, and, and some real confirmations of plate tectonics. It's a really powerful uh, method for uh, understanding what's going on in the solid part of the Earth, but also um, all parts of the Earth. Uh, are related to plate tectonics. Um, but then there's still a few things that we don't understand. Um, hot spots, um, how many are related to mantle plumes? Are you on the zero side? Are you on the 49 side? Or are you somewhere in the middle? Um, and I think most scientists are not on the zero side, but there's a few very vocal people that are on the zero side and pushing hard to have no mantle plumes. Um, and then finally, what causes these tax free gravity lineations? I think we really don't understand this at all. And we need to go out in, in the oceans and do some more experiments. So sorry I took an extra few minutes, but uh, you might have other classes. But I'll take questions now. Thank you.